Today, I'm gonna recap first season of 2022 crime drama series called Tulsa King. Having endured nearly a quarter century in jail, aging and becoming gray, Dwight Manfredi, a former gang leader, finally savors the taste of freedom. During his time behind bars, he experienced a stabbing incident and found solace in the written words of poetry to pass the hours. Despite facing relentless pressure, he maintained his silence, never uttering a single word against the organization. His loyalty remains untarnished, and he holds hope that it will prove advantageous among familiar faces and old friends. Surprisingly, he is whisked away to a house on Long Island, deviating from the usual city rendezvous. As he steps into the room, he exchanges greetings with all his comrades. His brother Pete, now the head of the family, resides in a wheelchair. His son Vince assumes the next-in-command role, while other significant figures include Chicky and Glenn. Although the conversation encounters a rocky start, in retrospect, that becomes the brighter side as Dwight begins to feel abandoned. He is commanded to embark on a journey to Tulsa, Oklahoma, far away in the western realm, separating him from New York. The chain of command has shifted, leaving Dwight without a place in the new order of things. A clash of violence ensues between him and Chicky, with henchmen nearly taking his life, but reluctantly, he accepts his destiny. Tyson, a cab driver, retrieves him from Tulsa Airport. As they engage in an unusual conversation, Dwight encounters the new world for the first time. His lack of experience encompasses a lack of familiarity with smartphones and the internet, and he takes offense when labeled a gangster, displaying his detachment from contemporary lingo. Tyson grows irritated by Dwight's presumed behavior and makes a stop at a marijuana store, presenting Dwight with an opportunity. The area remains free from gang control, and with the aid of his family's resources, Dwight envisions boundless wealth and the ability to claim the territory as his own. He ventures inside, incapacitates the guard Fred, and rendezvous with the establishment's owner, Bodie. While scrutinizing the financial records, Dwight uncovers a significant amount of cash generated by the business. However, he deems Bodie's decision to stash all the money in an office locker as amateurish. He negotiates an agreement with Bodie, ensuring protection for his business from rival gangs, adversaries, and even law enforcement. Dwight stipulates a commission of 20% of the profits and secures his share immediately. Instructing Tyson to purchase a button shirt and a black Lincoln Navigator, he arranges to meet the following day. Tyson drops Dwight off at the Western Plains Hotel, assuming the role of his driver. As Dwight inhales the fresh air and embraces the expansiveness of the area, perhaps deep down, he finds a glimmer of contentment, having arrived at this place. Arranging for a cab, he plans an evening at the nearby Bread Two Buck Saloon. Dwight engages in delightful conversations with his fellow cowboy patrons and impresses the owner, Mitch, who, this time, fails to introduce himself to Dwight. The following day, Tyson shows up empty-handed, explaining that the dealer refuses to sell him the car. Dwight refuses to tolerate such a racist attitude and drives down to the dealer to set things straight. He secures the navigator and sets off with Tyson. They make a stop at the store, where Bodie updates Dwight on Jimmy, the owner of the farm that supplies their weed for sale. Displeased with the hotel Dwight is currently staying at, Bodie recommends the Mayo, the city's finest establishment. On his second evening at the saloon, Mitch finally approaches him, recognizing Dwight as a fellow former prisoner. Mitch himself served approximately eight years in prison and now manages the bar alongside his father. Their conversation gets interrupted when a girl inquires if Dwight is famous. When he declines to take a photo with her, another woman approaches Dwight, confronting him. They share a flirtatious moment, and Dwight escorts the girls to a strip club, even resorting to knocking down an overly forward man who becomes too comfortable with one of the girls. Impressed by Dwight's actions, Stacy, the woman who confronted him, is sufficiently intoxicated to accompany him back to his hotel. When Dwight asks about her whereabouts during the assassination of former President Kennedy, she realizes Dwight is 75 years old. She hastily gathers her belongings and departs, unwilling to engage in such an association. Dwight is determined to rebuild his life, despite the tragic setbacks he experienced with his wife and daughters, Marie and Tina. His mission is to conquer the city, but soon enough, we discover his nemesis, the ATF squad, led by Armin Truzzi. Stacy herself is part of the squad and squirms in her seat as they discuss their plans to tail Dwight the following day during a meeting. Checking the details of her daughter, Christina, Dwight searches a website, but to proceed, it demands a card number, which he lacks. Attempting to send a package to New York, he faces a setback when the cashier informs him that they don't accept cash. At the coffee shop, the barista no longer serves coffee and glass, and the price has skyrocketed fivefold since the old days. Stacy inquires about Dwight's file, delving deeper into his past. His file reveals two murders, one outside the prison and one as an act of self-defense within. Despite having the opportunity to cooperate, he chose to stay silent and serve his time. While Stacy admires his integrity, she receives a warning to exercise caution around Dwight. Wandering through the city, he stumbles upon something known as the center of the universe, as a woman informs him. She explains that when someone stands inside the circle, those on the outside cannot hear a word. 
Curious, he gives it a try and verifies its efficacy. Vince expresses his fury towards Chicky for not taking any action against Dwight for his transgressions. According to the organization's rules, when a capo is struck, the perpetrator must be killed to uphold the chain of command. Chicky manages to calm Vince down and attempts to find a resolution. Dwight visits a bank in his quest to obtain a card, as he needs to reconnect with his daughter. But an obstacle arises, the banker reveals that his ID has expired. To obtain a new one, he must visit the Department of Public Service, where he resorts to deceit during the driver's exam and bribes the attendant to secure an earlier appointment. Manny receives word that Ike has returned to the city, interpreting it as a sign that Ike intends to kill him. Chicky contacts Dwight and informs him that to resolve the conflict, he must scrape together a hundred grand for Vince. Despite his initial resistance, Dwight acknowledges that it's the right course of action. Stacy makes the decision to visit Dwight and reveal her true identity. Dwight reacts poorly and vents about his chaotic personal life, treating Stacy rudely. She calmly exits the hotel, leaving Dwight with instant remorse for his behavior. We witness Tyson's father encouraging him to pursue a career through college instead of working for a gangster. They share a supportive and amicable relationship, and Tyson assures his father that he is seeking business knowledge. Accompanied by Bodie, Dwight and Tyson head to Jim the Creek's farm. Bodie cautions Dwight about his cousin, Badface, who happens to be the first person they encounter at the farm. Tensions rise between Badface and Dwight, but Jimmy swiftly intervenes to defuse the situation. The subsequent scene showcases why Dwight was a formidable force in his prime and why he still possesses those skills. With great insight into the vast expanse of Jimmy's land, Dwight negotiates the prices for acquiring raw material, recognizing that Jimmy is capitalizing on their lack of knowledge about his other business ventures. Impressed by Dwight's intellect, Jimmy strikes a deal with him, and on the journey back home, Dwight indulges in smoking weed. Under its influence, he goes on a rant about the younger generation and their ways, expressing regret over the decline of traditional values in modern society. Dwight finally receives his card in the mail, enabling him to set up an account on the website. He retrieves Christina's information but is met with her husband, Emery, when he calls. Emery informs Dwight that Christina does not wish to speak with him. Hearing children in the background, Dwight requests to hear Christina's voice, and she obliges briefly before disconnecting upon learning of Dwight's desire to see her. Heartbroken, Dwight seeks solace at the center of the universe, pouring out his emotions. He regrets not being there for Christina and ending their contact, acknowledging the difficulty it brought upon him. Dwight longs for a different life for Christina and hopes for a future reunion. Stacy and the ATF team engage in an attempt to apprehend an individual named Mr. Dumont. Another man named Keel is brought down, but instead of offering assistance, he provokes Keel, leading to a destructive explosion that claims both their lives. Meanwhile, Dwight sits outside a cafe, observing a stray white horse named Pilot. The waitress remarks that Dwight has been a fixture in the area for as long as she can remember, as he resides nearby. She adds, not all horses are fond of the pasture, eliciting a wry smile from Dwight. He practices his driving skills in preparation for a significant test scheduled for that day. Tyson inquires about Dwight's position in the grand scheme of things five years down the line. Dwight attempts to convey that it might not be the wisest choice. Perhaps Tyson should focus on pursuing higher education. But Tyson remains resolute in his desire to work for Dwight. They visit Bodie's store, where they discuss the commercial applications of nitrous oxide. Dwight sees it as a potential business opportunity and sets his sights on the Ogallala Land Music Festival. He presents the idea to Mitch, suggesting they could rake in a substantial sum of over a hundred grand. Mitch agrees, and he can procure nitrous oxide in bulk for his restaurant's needs. Armin lies in wait for Dwight and tailgates him in his car. Dwight picks up Paul, the driving instructor for the test. Suddenly, Armin pulls up alongside them and opens fire on the vehicle. With quick reflexes, Dwight shields Paul from harm and gives chase. Eventually, they are apprehended by the police, although Armin manages to escape. Due to his prior convictions, Dwight faces intense questioning but Stacy arrives at the station and extricates him from the situation. Meanwhile, Armin sets the car ablaze, and Dwight remains tight-lipped, refusing to provide any information to the police. He intends to interrogate the man himself. Stacy and Dwight share a dinner where they connect over the shared challenges and loneliness they face in their respective professions. Their mutual isolation leads to a night of intimacy and vulnerability. Stacy feels embarrassed but also captivated by the experience. Dwight informs Chicky about the shooting incident and the capo pledges to investigate further. Vincent couldn't have been the perpetrator, so someone else must be responsible. Stacy revisits the footage of the men connected to the exploded house. Subsequently, several new characters are introduced. Kale and Walter, also known as Keel, heads the Black Macadam, a motorcycle gang associated with criminal activity. A sudden increase in their armament catches the attention of the ATF. Each member of the gang has a criminal background. Edgar Dumont, who perished in the explosion, 
was previously KLN's cellmate. Robbie Trucott and Carson Pike serve as henchmen, with the latter also acting as KLN's personal bodyguard. Another addition is Rochelle Roxy Harrington, who possesses expertise in munitions and shares a close connection with KLN. The immediate focus for Stacy revolves around these three men. Dwight visits Paul at the hospital, bringing him flowers to express gratitude for Dwight's intervention that spared Paul from serious harm. The gangster offers Paul an envelope of money in exchange for information about the car. Paul discloses the car's make, model, and the initial four digits of the license plate. Dwight gives Tyson a severance payment, relieving him of his duties. He contemplates how frightened his family must have been upon witnessing the car and how angry they would be if the assailant mistook Tyson for Dwight. Despite this, Tyson insists on remaining involved in this life, and Dwight reluctantly accepts, reminding him that it was Tyson's own choice to stay and he must live with the consequences. Dwight instructs Tyson to acquire a different car, one that is not the same model or color. Stacy rescues a stray dog from the aforementioned house, while Dwight investigates the burned-out car. They trace its connection to an employee at Fenario Ranch, located near their vicinity. Dwight positions himself on the ranch, patiently waiting for the employees to depart. Meanwhile, Tyson practices his tough dialogue for work with Dwight, unaware that his father listens outside, filled with disappointment and fear. Dwight tails the unknown man to his residence but fails to recognize him. Just as he is about to exit his vehicle and confront the man, he spots Armand's son rushing out to greet him, forcing Dwight to reconsider his next move. After his wife departs with their children, Armando finally receives a visit from Dwight. Anxiously, Armando pleads with his former boss to let him go, as his wife will return soon. The confusion stems from Armando's belief that Dwight has come to kill him, unable to fathom any other reason for Dwight's presence in Tulsa. Manny possesses insider knowledge about the boy's incident, which apparently played a role in Dwight's imprisonment. Pete, Dwight's brother, orchestrated a setup, leading the gang to suspect Dwight had turned on them. Consequently, Armando now finds himself indebted to Dwight for protection and back in his employ. Dwight heads to the city to have new suits tailored, and trusting his ring to Tyson, who now serves as both his security detail and confidant. The plan is set to sell balloons at the fair that evening. Mitch successfully acquires the nitrous oxide, and Dwight assigns Bodie, his friends, and Tyson to handle the sales. Unbeknownst to them, the Black Macadam already conducts business in that territory. When Dwight's men confront the bikers, they swiftly lay claim to the stall, causing the bikers to back down without a fight. Manny's wife suggests that they relocate, believing they had left Manny's past behind in New York. However, now that Dwight has re-entered his life, she feels their safety is compromised. Waltrip berates his men for yielding the territory and subjects them to a beating. He orders them to reclaim the space. Manny attempts to offer an old antique to Dwight as a means of paying off his weekly debt, but Dwight is not interested. Mark, Tyson's father, remains concerned for his son upon noticing the ring Dwight gave him. The old man recognizes the impressive display but remains aware of the trouble his son is getting involved in. In an attempt to persuade Tina to talk to him, Dwight reaches out to his sister, Joanne. However, she declines his request and discloses that their brother Joe has been diagnosed with lymphoma. Acting in accordance with Waltrip's instructions, his men brutally assault Dwight's crew. Tyson suffers severe injuries, and Mark loses control upon witnessing the aftermath. Mark laments the fact that Tyson fails to appreciate the sacrifices his parents have made and the opportunities they have provided. Dwight asserts that they will retrieve their tanks and the money taken by Waltrip's men. Meanwhile, Stacy heeds her co-worker's advice and engages in a casual encounter with a stranger named Colton at the bar. Simultaneously, Dwight and the gang seek revenge against McAdam. Mark joins them, using GPS to track Tyson. Dwight brings brings a bag filled with baseball bats. Despite being outnumbered, they emerge victorious and reclaim their money. Celebrating as a united front, they share beer, and Dwight rewards the men with proceeds from the balloon sales. Although they sustain significant injuries, their resilience is what truly matters. Mark presents Tyson with another opportunity to return home, leaving him with a difficult choice to make. Joanne contacts Dwight from the hospital. Joe, their brother, is deteriorating as his cancer becomes untreatable. Though he cannot respond, he can still hear. Dwight recounts a childhood memory of them visiting a bakery on Easter to buy cookies. He tells Joe that if he encounters God, he should go with him as Dwight will meet him in heaven later. The emotional phone call concludes, leaving Dwight in a state of heartbreak as he sinks into his chair. Manny once again encounters his neighbor's dog's mess. However, this time, he takes the shoe he stepped in it with and confronts the neighbor, smearing it in their face. The incident fills him with renewed vigor, leading him to inform his wife that they will stay. The following day, Tyson picks up Dwight, and the boss advises his young apprentice to be himself when Tyson mentions the possibility of dyeing his hair. Joe, Dwight's brother, has passed away, and his memorial is being held in NYC. Dwight arrives at the location, and we also get a glimpse of his childhood neighborhood. Upon reaching, Joanne, his sister, warmly embraces and welcomes him. Tina is surprised to see her long-estranged father after so many years, but he avoids any interaction. Dwight pays his respects to Joe and Denise, the widow. He expresses deep regret for not staying connected with his family earlier and missing the chance to be a responsible family man. During the conversation, Dwight eagerly inquires about Tina's family and Joanne introduces him to everyone. He is relieved to know that his 
daughter is doing well. He gets the idea to invite the entire family to a dinner at a four-star restaurant, but the plan doesn't go smoothly. Tina walks away, once again refusing to engage with him. The local nitrous supply is under the control of the Black Macadams, and they take the actions of Dwight's men seriously. They instruct the officers on their payroll to take care of the situation, providing them with the license plate number of Dwight's car. The officers apprehend Tyson, who is unsuspecting, and throw him in jail while impounding the car. Next on the gang's list is Bodhi. They discover his location through Tyson's phone and abduct him. Chucky calls Dwight to the hospital to meet Pete, but Dwight doesn't go the same day. Manny receives a warning about the Black Macadam. Initially, he brushes it off, but soon enough, he catches up with their criminal history. Stacy and Dwight appear to develop a strong bond, and she gives him a warning about the Black Macadam. He takes her word seriously, and Tyson finally manages to communicate with him. Bodhi faces interrogation from Waltrip, the leader of the Macadams. It's an intense encounter where Bodhi's life is genuinely at risk. However, there is a moment of relief for Dwight's men as Bodhi is brought to Mitch's bar. Since it falls under Cherokee land, the police have no authority, and they are compelled to leave Bodhi in Mitch's care. Before visiting Pete, Dwight stops by Tina's flower shop. The father and daughter have a tense exchange where she refuses to address him with the familial title and instead uses his name. Her sadness and trauma stem from Dwight's absence as a father. She recalls how Dwight was the only one missing on her prom night and how the entire family rallied together to make her feel supported. There also appears to be a cry for help as Tina discloses that Nico, one of the gang members and Dwight's old friend, attempted to sexually assault her. This revelation ignites Dwight's anger, and despite her plea for non-violence, it seems unlikely that he will comply. Dwight arrives at the hospital but finds no one there. He confronts a better than Pete and chastises him for failing to take care of the family in Dwight's absence, despite promising to do so. Pete appears confused throughout the conversation, and when Dwight tries to intimidate him about Nico, Pete remains blank, convincing Dwight of Pete's innocence. In a manner befitting a gangster, Dwight storms into the club where Chucky and others are gathered, and he brutally annihilates Nico, reducing his head to a pool of brains on the floor. Roxy, the eccentric co-worker of Armin, turns out to be an undercover informant for the ATF. She describes Dwight as the real deal. Stacy tries to shield him, but Doug, her partner, insists that Rory provide more information. Doug also connects Dwight to the mafia that the FBI is pursuing and decides to inform them. Pete berates Chucky for suggesting they target Tina and Dwight, but the capo takes note of it. Dwight lingers around Tina's store and reveals to her that he killed Nice. She worries about her family's safety, but Dwight assures her that Pete won't allow any harm to come to them. He emphasizes that she is the only thing that truly matters to him. Tyson picks up Dwight and recounts the events that unfolded during his absence. Dwight immediately becomes concerned about the potential connection the police may have made with Bodhi, so they set out to find him. However, the shop is closed, and Bodhi isn't answering his phone. Doug contacts FBI agent Ruiz and shares information about Dwight. Roxy advises Manny to convince Dwight to reconcile with Walter. If the animosity persists, it could have severe consequences for both sides. Tina receives a mysterious phone call from someone who remains silent. Dwight believes so and assures Tina that he will investigate. He then calls Goody, the family's consigliere, and suggests that he fly down to Tulsa to discuss the matter. Pete approves the plan, stating that as long as Dwight delivers their share, he is off limits. The following morning, Stacy meets with Dwight to explain her dilemma. She informs him that the FBI is now involved and he must stop. No matter where he goes, this predicament will continue to haunt him. Ruiz and his team arrive at Bonhai's house and later at his marijuana shop, thoroughly searching his safe, which contained leftover weed and cash. All of it is gone, despite Dwight repeatedly urging Bodhi to relocate it. The attempts to negotiate a truce between Waltrip and Dwight prove unsuccessful. Neither party is willing to back down, and instead of easing tensions, they seem to have stirred up even more conflicts. Mitch's place becomes the setting for Bodhi to share the news with the assembled group. To everyone's surprise, Dwight reveals that he and Mitch cleared out everything before the FBI could raid the establishment, anticipating such a situation. This revelation brings sheer joy to Bodhi, and Dwight extends an invitation for him to join everyone for dinner. Furthermore, Dwight firmly believes that Bodhi did not betray him to the FBI. Spencer, the waitress at Dwight's frequented cafe, is formally introduced to him. When he inquires about Pilot, she informs him that they have decided to euthanize him due to repeated escape attempts. Dwight accompanies Spencer to Pilot's owner and purchases him. He also hires Spencer to care for Pilot temporarily. Stacy tries unsuccessfully to persuade Dwight to expose Walter, leaving her with a bitter aftertaste. Could it be their final farewell? It certainly seems that way. Dwight takes Pilot to the farm where Armin places him in a field for a week. The owner allows Pilot to stay temporarily in exchange for payment, but Dwight knows he needs to find a new home for Pilot soon. The Manfredi family faces simultaneous attacks from two fronts. As feared, Chicky assaults Emery, Tina's husband, in an alley, breaking his arm and sending him to the hospital. Roxy's boyfriend is dispatched alone to Mitch's bar with the intention of killing Mitch, but he and Dwight join forces and eliminate Pike together. Dwight and Mitch dispose of Pike's body and send his jacket, riddled with bullet holes, to the Black Macadams. Meanwhile, Pete's health is improving in New York. He is back home, and according to the doctor, he can have another 15 years of 
if he takes good care of himself. Chicky doesn't seem pleased to hear that news. Tina finally manages to reach Dwight and brings up the incident. She believes that Emery has been attacked, but Dwight knows the truth. He suggests that she and her family come to Tulsa for their safety, but she remains uncertain. Tyson and Armand pick up Goody from the station. The consigliere is surprised and feels threatened upon seeing Armand again, but Armand reassures him that Dwight's presence in Tulsa was merely a coincidence. Roxy is inconsolable when one of the bikers opens the package containing Pike's jacket. Badai and the others return to work only to find the place in disarray. Badai also retrieves a hidden pen drive from the safe's hinges. One can only wonder what's on it. Stacy meets with Roxy after learning about Pike. It is revealed that Roxy is involved in an arrangement with the ATF serving as an informant to avoid jail time. Stacy grows desperate for any evidence and asks Roxy to make one final attempt to retrieve something. This will be her last chance. Goody assures Dwight that he is unaware of Nico's situation and claims to have no knowledge of Emery's beating Avid. That night, he contacts Pete and Chicky. When he mentions that Dwight gave his ring to Tyson, Pete becomes angry and starts rambling. He even silences Chicky, who can only afford to remain quiet once again. Goody informs them that Dwight might be beyond their control now, as he seems to be in his element in Tulsa. Tina continues to receive calls from the unknown stranger, and her frustration is growing. Following Stacy's request, Roxy breaks in but soon discovers Waltrip waiting for her. She is caught in the act and is forced to reveal the truth. Initially, it appears that Waltrip is propositioning her to become his mistress. However, he ends up strangling her and uses Roxy's phone to call Stacy and issue a warning. Margaret, the owner of the horse ranch, asks Dwight out to dinner. During their conversation, Dwight presents a new business idea of starting a casino and making Badhai his partner. He then reveals that all this time, he has been involved in stealing from people who purchase Bitcoin. Dwight is not the only criminal in town. The information about Bitcoin is what the pen drive contains. In his chapel, Chicky confesses to the father that he feels suffocated by his father. Despite wanting to join the army and make something of himself, Chicky was forced into working for Pete. He was deprived of a normal life and regrets the missed opportunity. Tina suggests the idea of moving away to Emery, but he reacts poorly. Emery tries to console Tina, explaining that they shouldn't uproot their lives just because Dwight asked them to, especially after all the suffering Tina endured. She agrees, and they find solace in their shared commitment. While bathing Pete, Chicky once again becomes irritated by him. This time, he loses control and drowns Pete in the bathtub. Dwight and Margaret's date goes smoothly, and he reveals his past to her. However, Margaret is more intrigued than disgusted by his confession. Wearing a wig all along, Chicky descends the stairs with his father's body, now assuming the role of the family's new boss. He attributes the death to a heart attack and tells Vince that they they need to steer the family back on track. News of Pete's demise reaches Dwight, who falls into deep contemplation and declares his absence from the funeral. Dwight and Mitch, faced with the escalating threat of the Black Macadams and the issues in New York, provide firearms training to their group of inexperienced, regular guys. Among the inexperienced bunch, Jane impresses Dwight with her shooting skills. She shares a tragic story of her father teaching her how to shoot before taking his own life a few years ago. She pleads with Dwight to be their leader and guide them out of the predicament he brought them into. Now, he holds the responsibility for all of them. They hold respect for his authority and stand united behind him in all his endeavors. Stacy visits Waltrip but encounters resistance from the Irishman. She realizes there's nothing she can do to incriminate him for Roxy, and he is well aware of it. Jimmy agrees to become Dwight and Mitch's partner for their casino plan. During Pete's wake, Chicky discusses the family's plans for moving forward. They have decided to eliminate Dwight, known as the General, and establish a new order. When Johnny, one of the capos, interjects, Chicky threatens his life. He firmly establishes himself as the new leader, and the situation appears grim for Dwight. The ATF and the FBI hold a meeting. Stacy learns about Margaret which shocks her, but she attempts to divert attention away from Dwight. She asserts that the primary focus should be on the Black Macadams for now. Tyson moves out of the house, leaving his father conflicted about the decision. They bid each other farewell, and Dwight urges Tyson to exercise caution. Tina appears to be growing closer to Dwight and entertains the idea of temporarily relocating to Tulsa. Margaret's ex-husband, Brian, meets Dwight and warns him against getting involved with Margaret for money. He holds no fear of Dwight and vows to keep a watchful eye from a distance to ensure Margaret's well-being. Waltrip attempts to bribe his corrupt cops into arresting Manfredi and later plans to murder him right inside the cell. However, when they make the move, Manfredi makes it abundantly clear that turning him into an enemy will have fatal consequences for them, and he does so in a stylish manner. Stacy assures her therapist that she has put an end to her involvement with Dwight, whom she claims reminds her of her father. Dwight receives a call from Chicky, who pretends to want reconciliation and to bury the hatchet. He hints at visiting with his trusted men in the near future. After hanging up, Vince praises Chicky's acting skills, confirming their plan. Once again, Clara expresses her concerns about Armand's association with Dwight. They engage in a heated argument where Armand firmly states their refusal to move, while Clara declares that she will divorce him if they don't relocate. Stacy meets Dwight and urges him to move on from 
Walter. The biker leader no longer holds any influence in the city after the FBI raided his headquarters and is now being pursued by law enforcement. During their conversation, they spot Waltrip and his lieutenant approaching from behind. Gunfire erupts, resulting in Waltrip losing his companion but also injuring Stacy. The police arrive at the scene, and Manfredi is taken into custody for questioning. He vows to eliminate Waltrip at the earliest opportunity. In a flashback from 1997, we find ourselves in California witnessing Chicky, Vince, and Armin together. The first two are inflicting torment upon Ripple, a worker for the family. In a state of panic, Armin calls Dwight, unable to prevent the torture. Dwight rushes in and puts an end to the ordeal. Unfortunately, the location gradually becomes engulfed in flames, spreading relentlessly. Ripple, chained to a radiator, cannot be freed as the key is lost. While others flee the scene, Dwight chooses to show mercy by granting Ripple a swift death. This is the incident that led to his imprisonment. Bodhai assigns Elliot as Dwight's defense attorney. Despite the police, ATF, and FBI lacking substantial evidence against him, Dwight walks away without any charges. Dwight visits Stacy, who is recovering in the hospital. He expresses his gratitude, acknowledging that her act of saving him cannot be repaid. Dwight learns from Stacy that Walter, the biker leader, possesses significant wealth and influence, making it unlikely for him to be apprehended. When Waltrip instructs his men to launch a final, explosive attack against Dwight and his crew in order to eliminate them permanently, one of them speaks up, suggesting they lay low instead. However, Waltrip shoots him dead, making it clear to the others that they have no choice. Armand recounts his reaction after Dwight's arrest in 1997. Chicky reached out to him, and the following year, he was so frustrated that he wanted to end everything. However, when he met Chicky, he froze and simply drove west. He eventually stopped in Tulsa, which is how he ended up there. Armand declares to Dwight that he refuses to run again and will stand by his side in the fight. Chicky, Goody, and Vince find themselves caught off guard by Dwight and his crew amidst the sweltering weather. Dwight and his crew threaten Chicky and Vince, ordering them to return to New York and never set foot in his town again without permission. Dwight offers Goody a job, and he accepts. Goody is now the boss, while Chicky and Vince are escorted back to the airport. At Bread Buck, Dwight delivers a passionate speech emphasizing the significance of progress, confronting challenges, and doing so together. He urges all his men to support one another and weather this storm as a united family. Dwight requests Bodhi's assistance in hacking into Waltrip's laptop, and the former computer geek confirms his ability to do so. Mitch and his father engage in a conversation about Dwight and agree that he can be trusted. Bodhi drains Waltrip's accounts, and Tyson delivers a pen drive containing details of a $1 million account to Stacy, who reluctantly accepts it. The day of reckoning arrives for Dwight and his men. Waltrip and his gang arrive armed to the teeth, but the bar is prepared to confront them. A fierce battle ensues, with bullets flying from both sides. Despite Tyson being shot in the arm, Dwight takes matters into his own hands, engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat and ultimately eliminating Waltrip. The crew emerges victorious, stronger than ever, and revels in their triumph. We fast forward three months to a promising future for the Manfredi family. It is the opening day of the casino, and Dwight watches over Tina's children while she rides on pilot. Margaret becomes acquainted with Tina and discusses the night with Dwight. He is thrilled to have his family reunited and even receives the enduring title of dad from Tina. Stacy is set to be reinstated into the police force, but her superiors impose a condition for her return. She must deliver Dwight to them. As the night grows darker and more enjoyable, something draws Dwight away from the bar. Stacy has reported him to the police and uses the pen drive as evidence accusing him of attempting to bribe a federal officer and obstructing a federal investigation. Dwight and Tina watch in shock as he is once again taken into custody. Don't neglect to give that like button a tap and subscribe to the channel for all the latest updates.